when I get the word from the boss here. Word. Word. <laughs> Grab a seat, everybody. Everybody. Grab a seat, please. We want to have a lot of time with our <coughs> district attorney. Good morning. I'm Betsy Gottbaum, oops, executive director of Citizens Union, and I'm very, very pleased to have John Avalon, our wonderful board member, who is going to be the, what are you going to be, the moderator? I Yes, I guess so. An guess interviewer, so. I don't and know. Conversation <laughs> partner. Conversation <laughs> partner. What does that mean? Um, and our district attorney, Alvin Bragg, who and he and I have become, I'd say, great colleagues, yes. and I'm very, very pleased that he's here, and, and you can ask Questions from the yeah, floor? Yeah. yeah. He's a very brave man. He's going to take questions from you all. Anyway, I'm sorry to say that Randy couldn't be here, but I'm subbing for him. And there we go. All right. Beautiful. Thank you, Betsy. Quick. Um, quick, quick, quick. It's great to see you all here. This attorney, thank you so much for being here. Monday, are they all right? Oh, that's right. You don't need that. That's right. <laughs> beauty of lavalier uh thank you so much for being here uh this is you know you are in such an important position at an important time and uh citizens union is dedicated to the ideas that, that, that you're working on i want to hit a lot of different topics and then get to questions uh we're going to talk about obviously crime quality of life corruption trump prosecutions but also some specific policy reforms uh that that you're working on that, that our audience is interested in and that's before we get to the questions so first of all um Look, you know, Mario Cuomo famously said, you, you know, campaign in poetry, you govern in prose. Uh, you came in, you made a lot of promises during the campaign, a, a day one memo that was, you know, very controversial to some people, but a fulfillment of your campaign promises. I wonder what in the last two years uh, you've learned on the job that's perhaps changed your perspective, uh, things you might do differently, things, just lessons learned. So, well, happy to be here. Good to see everyone, uh, and uh, I guess I will, I'll answer in part with sort of why I'm so excited to be here. So, you know, I've spent 20 years as a government lawyer, as a, as a, as a prosecutor, as a lawyer um, uh, in the Southern District of New York, in the Public Integrity Unit, in the New York State Attorney General's Office, in the Public Integrity Unit. So very happy to be here because like these are the issues I've spent uh, 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 most of my career on. Uh, but I mentioned that in response to your question, because, you know, when I was transitioning into the office, I spent about a thousand hours focusing on building the legal team. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I don't know if anyone else did this in school where you like study the subject, you know, well, and then you don't for me, it's like, oh, I, I need to spend more time on math. Um, didn't focus on kind of the, as, as much as I would like in retrospect on sort of the small P political stakeholders, communications. I think some of that's a product of, you know, particularly in the sort of federal prosecution world, you have the Hatch Act. You're just not, you're so involved, you know, yeah. not, not engaged in that. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the interaction between sort of representative democracy in this role and the independence of a prosecutor is something I still think about uh, almost every day. Uh, but certainly early on, uh, internally, I think I probably may have lawyered almost too much. That was what was comfortable to me and um, didn't engage uh, enough sort of externally. So, so we had the ideas, we had the blueprint. Um, my prior management jobs, I've been chief deputy at the New York State Attorney General's office. So overseeing an office of 1500, I'd done that. Sure. Uh, but what I hadn't done was the part of sort of, sort of selling the ideas publicly. And I think also in particular, very early on, there's no body of work. Um, so one, I've worked on sort of really thinking and we've, we've sort of deepened our staff and we have expertise in that area and I talk to folks, um, but really trying to explain what we do. And I think most importantly, contextualize it um, around public safety. We're gonna give yeah. you one example, I know it's sort of a long answer, but we were just talking about this work with the Fortune Society. Uh, so we just launched a new, new program funding the Fortune Society to um, have uh, someone who's, you know, you're kind of engaged uh, formally, uh, either incarcerated or engaged with the justice system in our arraignment parks. So when someone gets released, uh, they can be asked, like, what do you need? Mm -hmm. If it's food, they'll, they'll take them food. Most importantly, if it's housing, they'll literally take them from the arraignment to Fortune Society's emergency housing. I, I would, two years ago, I've explained that as a, you know, social justice program as a supporting humanity program, which it certainly is. And I think that's important. 
uh, but particularly from this seat. And the reason why we do it is it's a public safety program, right? I know from the data that the folks who are going to be sort of supported generally don't come back, right? They would mm -hmm. warrant, uh, we would see them again when they commit another crime. So it's a recidivism program, it's sure. a public safety program. And so being a lot more directed about sort of explaining and contextualizing how what we're doing is advancing public safety. I think that for me is the, the biggest lesson of the okay. first two years. I mean, look, certainly, I mean, I, I think having a holistic view, uh, it's not just about prosecutions, it's about, you know, overall is, 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 is an important thing that I think you brought, um, have brought to the office. But I mean, you know, where the rubber meets the road is the results, not, you know, and I think we can all assume good intentions on it. We should be doing that more in our politics and civics, assuming good intentions. Um, but, you know, Mayor Adams, um, you know, complicated figure, and, and, uh, but he's, he's criticized you for saying that a lack of prosecutor enforcement has made the city less safe. That's why he's had a hard time. Now, keep in mind, I want to make this point because this goes against certain talking points. Crime is getting better in the city since the spike in 2020, but it is still way above where it was for decades beginning in the mid 1990s. So I just want you to address that, that criticism from the mayor, not, not a new concept to you, but how do you address it? Sure, oh, so the, the, the first thing I say is I think that criticism is a bit dated. I, I haven't heard him uh, say that uh, probably in about 18 months. Mm -hmm. And I think this would, it goes back to sort of a body of work. Um, you're right, we have a lot more work to do where no one is declaring victory. But in Manhattan, every single crime indicator is down from last year, with the exception of grand larceny auto. That, 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 that is incredible movement in the right direction. Um, we have more work to do. We want to get back to the pre-COVID uh, uh, you know, levels. But what I've found, after, after sort of a bumpy, bumpy start you know, in terms of communications and relationships, is really an incredible partnership, particularly with the day-to-day -day partners, mm -hmm. you know, the police commissioner and NYPD. Uh, and in my interactions with City Hall, uh, you know, I interact with the mayor. I also just happen to be in a sort of great position that a number of his deputy mayors I've known for years yeah. uh, and I've sort of, you know, co-governed with in other contexts. So I, 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 my, my sense is we're really on the same page uh, and that uh, that body of work of having two years of data I mean, you know, what, what we spent the most time focusing on has been shootings. Shootings are down in Manhattan this year, 22 percent mm -hmm. year to date. And that's on top of 20 percent last year. Now, they're not down to 2018 levels yet. So we, right. we've got we've got to work. And I can explain how I think we're getting there and we're getting there sort of together <laughs> uh, with 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 the NYPD, which, you know, by extension, would be the mayor. Well, I mean, there, there, I think there are three levels concern right beyond the sort of perception level which i don't think should be dismissed but you need to back it with statistics mm. right um one there, there's you know concern about um uh, about discovery and and people delaying uh you know that that 60-day window but i also looked at some court uh court statistics and there's a, a category called uh, disposed of right where basically there's a declination to prosecute um felony assaults um 77 were disposed of Gun arrests, 47% were disposed of. That's up from 26%. 65% of car thefts. That seems to be a prosecutorial decision. And it, it, there may be lots of reasons for it, but in those numbers, um, help, help me understand why those decisions seem to be made. So I think if you look at those citywide, we also are- Citywide, it's, it's the same. I'm looking, those are solely Manhattan. Yeah, and I, I think our Manhattan numbers are, we, we, we tend to be either because of resources, infrastructure, you know, be better in those numbers than the rest of the citywide averages. Uh, there, there's a mix of reasons. Uh, one is, uh, you know, NYPD are not lawyers, and so sometimes things are getting written up and they just don't meet the elements, and that's just okay. us doing our, our job. Um, you mentioned something else, which is the, you, which maybe everyone may not know about, or it's a very informed room that may... may Wonky so but the, important that yeah, we found. Very, very important. Yeah. The discovery laws change. So yeah. we spent a lot of time talking about um, the bail laws, the ones that have really had the impact on our practice uh, in terms of sort of morale and sort of nuts and bolts is the disclosure rule. So we, we have to produce more evidence to the defense earlier, which on balance is a really, really good principled thing. Uh, what the statute, and this I think goes directly to your point, we think has wrong and we've been telling Albany this, is the, the relief. Uh, so what do I mean? In the year before I took office, so just to create a little distance, so I'm not talking about my, about myself, mm -hmm. 1,800 misdemeanor cases were dismissed in Manhattan, not on the merits, but because they timed out. 
the the prosecution. Is that the defense attorney gaming the system in many cases? It it, it is, and I I I'm fair. I don't think it's I think it's zealous advocacy. They're doing their job, right? That's okay. what they're supposed to do. That's their that's their function, right? Um, they can get a case case dismissed. You know, they're not they're not charged with public safety like right. we are, right? Uh, and so some of it is aggressive litigation. Some of it is, um, I respectfully submit a kind of narrow interpretation of the statute. I mean, we're in court arguing to the judges. But let me, let me just give you a couple of examples, which I think kind of, um, and maybe I'll enlist some support and folks kind of helping us in Albany. Uh, we, we, we had a domestic abuse case uh, where, you know, I won't go into the facts, but, you know, significant uh, of, of facts where we, as we, as we do in almost every case with a survivor, uh, we have a phenomenal uh, team of, of clinicians, social workers, advocates, uh, you know, provided scaffolding, uh, and support with our team, but then referred the person to uh, outside counseling, uh, which included sort of a, a car a car trip to the counseling. We disclosed that because that's a benefit to a witness. We're required to. We disclosed that what, in a timely manner. Uh-huh. What we did not do, and this was then litigated, was like the underlying receipt for the cab service we did not produce within that window the judge dismissed the case. And that, that's just, that's not, I don't, I don't think that's justice. So you think in that case, it's, yeah, it, that's, that's just, not, but that's happening every day. That's how you get to that 1800 number of dismissal. And we put together a rather broad uh, coalition last year in Albany to try to get some measure of proportionality. Well, I, I want to get to that, you know, because sometimes you got to reform reforms. I mean, again, good intentions, bail reform had a lot of good intentions, but, you know, sometimes you got to reform criminal justice reforms. Um, but I just want to 77% felony assaults uh, being disposed of. Does that seem, I mean, do you want to, do you want to bring that down or does that seem like, well, that's just the way it, it goes? Because it looks like, you know, from a, from a street crime level that that's saying that, you know, there's a two thirds, you know, three quarters chance that you're going to walk. Yeah. Look, I, what I, what I would say is if those actually happened and they're provable mm-hmm. that, you know, felony assault's important. What I know from the numbers is a number of those, and I can't, I don't have the breakdown specifically, but we could get it to you. Sure. Of um, a number of those come in as a felony assault, but they're not actually felony assaults. They're misdemeanor assaults. A number of them come as a felony assault. And then you go to call the victim and the victim says, I don't want to go forward because I, you know, I wasn't injured that Got much it. or whatever the maybe I don't want the hassle of it. Uh, and so those are not, I mean, I think to read those as where we or my colleagues in the other four boroughs sure. are making decisions on all those is not, I mean, so much goes And, and I should it. say it's, their numbers are much worse in the Bronx and Brooklyn in particular. What about shoplifting? Just because that's, that's an indicator that people see where it seems like <laughs> it's been effectively decriminalized uh, and, and, and that, you know, feels like disorder to people. Uh, I think, understandably, uh, are you concerned about about that? Where it seems like it's not being prosecuted. So uh, you know, and and again, I mean, I can I can talk about what we are doing, sure. which is you know, we're 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 prosecuting those cases. We started a small business alliance probably about two months into office, right. uh, and you know, coordinated with NYPD. I mean, most almost everything we do, we try to be data driven on, uh, and so we paired our data with the NYPD's data. Uh, and came up with some very illuminating conclusions. So in Manhattan, uh, 18% of the people arrested for shoplifting account for about 45% of the arrests. That's Say that again. That's a really important <laughs> step. Uh, 18% of those arrested account for about 45%. So not rocket science. What do we do? We focused on them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so we've been focusing on that sort of core recidivist population uh, to... Uh, you know, to, to get results, to drive shoplifting down. Uh, and it's, it's, it's hard because it's not a small number. So it's a large, it's a large universe. Unlike we use the same approach in guns, right? But there are, thankfully far fewer people shooting people. Mm-hmm. So we focus on them. We have some really tremendous results there. Uh, but we, we've done a few things which I think are, are helpful and promising. So we focus on that number we have for the folks who are sort of really the core recidivists Rather than, I think, what, what is traditionally the model in Manhattan and around the country, say, person's go, we're going to see that person again. You know, if you shoot someone, we go out and try to go out and find you. If you shoplift, traditionally, it's, okay, we'll see you again when you're on the next shoplift. We've been, for the, that core, core population, indicting those cases and sort of getting on the front foot. Good. Um, now, look, what we are doing differently, uh, and I think the data will bear out, it's going to make us safer, is, you know, we don't take those cases and say, all right, well, we're just sending those folks to Rikers for six months because 
I think many of us have seen that story over. I mean, it means they'll just come right back out. So we are, you know, aggressively evaluating all of those cases, those cases and, all, and many others for, for diversion really on day two. So if someone gets arraigned, we look at what the, what the, you know, what the background is, what the offense is, and we have an entire division which we set up to now look at is there a, a mental health need? Is there a, is there a, is there a, uh, a drug treatment need? And to try to connect people, again, helps them. But to go back to my first point, it, that's, it cuts down on recidivism. And in shoplifting complaints in Manhattan are down 11% this year. That's a good stat as well. All right, I want to steer towards solutions, though, and you get this with regard to discovery reform. But Albany, um, you know, uh, th- there's, there's resistance to reforming it. By the way, Every reform in human history, well, uh, modern American history, has a period where it needs to be reformed. You got to assess what are the unintended consequences, what's working, what's not. What would you like to see Albany focus on to make your job um, more effective, your ability to do your job more effective in, in the areas of criminal justice reform, bail reform, looking at those reforms that they passed a few years ago? We spent a lot of time in Albany last year, and we will likely do so again on the discovery statute. <clears throat> it, it is what affects, I mean, a, the 1,800 dismissals, that's from 2021, so the year before I took office. Some of those cases maybe shouldn't have been brought. Some of those cases who may be on the merits may fall into the, it didn't meet the elements, but we should be affirmatively making that decision as opposed to them dying on the vine. And then we do. I mean, I gave that that one, one example. We have so many others. We had a, another very serious case where we belatedly found a photo, uh, and then the photo was inculpatory. It was, again, another assault, um, I think another domestic violence assault. Uh, and we said, Judge, we did our job. We acted in good faith. We did not. We exercised due diligence. We didn't find this this photo. The photo is inculpatory. It it, it helps us. Uh, it does not help the defense. We're turning it over now, and and the relief should be that we're precluded from using this photo, which would be quite damaging to the defense. That case was dismissed. Why? So the case was dismissed because of disclosure. The disclosure. disclosure. So getting proportionality. Uh, and so what we proposed last year. Um, consistent with my practice, you know, as both a federal and a state prosecutor, is we'll give you everything we have. We will give you everything uh, in our file that is responsive. Uh, we'll give you everything we get from the NYPD, and we'll give it to you within the statutory w- window right now. Um, then we want the sort of st- speedy trial clock to sort of be paused. Uh, and if the case goes to trial, um, then, you know, things that we might not have in our position possession, which we would argue would be, be ancillary or, or at a minimum certainly not um, you know, the most probative, uh, if that is then turned over later, we can then talk about what the relief should be. It may be that, okay, well, we won't, we won't use it, uh, um, but it shouldn't be dismissal. We shouldn't have cases dismissed uh, because, you know, the car receipt to a counseling service wasn't turned over. That just doesn't... So you're saying, Albany, listen to me. We yes, and we, and, we, and we had a very broad coalition last year. I think there's a little bit of fatigue on reforming the reform. I think there's also some... Um, Understandable apprehension because the, you know, I think there's a bit of a concern about slippery slopes. Like, oh, you're saying this today, but then you'll come back and you come back. And, and I, I will say the, 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 the repeated changes to a statute are destabilizing. It is challenging for our courts. Uh, okay. You know, our, our courts catch up. They finally kind of come up. To, and I mean, I should catch up to the wrong phraseology. They, they, they spend a year studiously parsing uh, what right. words mean and then the word changes. The word change. Uh, and, and, and consistency and predictability is important. So I think there is a cost to, I, I get, you, you, you mentioned the judicial piece of this. I just, New York's the only state in the country where judges can't take dangerousness into account. Do you think that's appropriate or do you think that should be changed? It's a red herring. This is a, and I've practiced, I've practiced. Okay. So let me, let me, on bail, I've, 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 I've made bail arguments as a federal prosecutor, state prosecutor, now obviously oversee local prosecution. I've made bail arguments as a defense lawyer. I've posted bail for loved ones. This is this conversation and, 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 and its shift away from discovery is such a red herring and a distraction, particularly where we are in the statute now, because there have been some changes that have been helpful to our practice. When we see on the cases that I think New Yorkers think about it's for dangerousness. Uh, so, for example, our gun cases, we ask for bail and we get bail routinely. Um, now, that bail is posted. And so sometimes, so sometimes folks are out on that on our very serious cases. Uh, what I've been talking to our prosecutors about is, you know, you'll see things like $3 million bail. What that, what that really means is remand. Mm-hmm. Like, just call it what it is. Uh, and so 
we we get bail on the cases and we seek it on the cases where there is um, particular harm and danger. I think the ones the public think about. Uh, and the statute was changed relatively recently. I think it was the I think the last iteration of the bail statute, which now allows prosecutors where there is it's called harm and harm. So if you are arrested on let's say you know day one uh, for uh, an offense and the harm is very elastic, so it could be the economic harm of shoplifting. Uh-huh. The, you know, and you uh, are arrested and you're out on bail on a Monday for, for that, uh, or, and then on Thursday you commit another shoplifting under the first iteration of the bail reform, that those were not bail eligible. Now they are. Uh, and so I think that, that, particularly with that change, and you look at the data, I mean, I, you know, look at the Manhattan data, our, our appearance in court is about flat from, prior to bail reform to now, and our rearrest rate is about the same. And when, particularly when I look at the violence cases, we should be spending the bandwidth and time talking about discovery in those 1,800 cases that are getting dismissed and not on what I think at this point is a red herring. Okay, question. fair enough. Let's, uh, but I should also say, if I didn't, that the, this uh, court stats I had were from the end of the year uh, 2022, because we don't have 2023, so it's important. Uh, let's talk about corruption. You speak again, public integrity more this major focus of what you've done. Um, just to recap very briefly, I mean, you've had uh, you know prosecutions against um, uh, Eric Ulrich, the commissioner of, of buildings. Uh, you you seeded uh, looking to straw donors into the mayor's campaign. Different case, but one that seems to be echoed on the federal level, which has led mostly to the seizure of the mayor's electronic devices by the FBI. Um, what do should New Yorkers take away when they see their mayor and his administration under investigation, seemingly on so many fronts? So I, I'm not going to presume to tell New Yorkers what they should think. We've got to, you know, we have a... Uh, uh, We're opinionated enough, but, but you are the top legal uh, figure in the city, Manhattan. I, I'm, I'm certainly not going to do it on an on a open, active investigation, and certainly one that is not my own and, you know, or being overseen by my friend Damian Williams. What, what, what I can say, and this is why I've sort of focused on this, and, and, and you're right, I mean, our, our two sort of its most prominent cases in this space, we, you know, we've indicted and have a bribery scheme uh, for a former, former buildings commissioner and others. Uh, and then we indicted six persons in a straw biner, straw donor uh, scheme relating to the mayor's campaign. I, I think that kind of work is important. I think it's important to confidence in the system, one that we have you know, kind of one set of rules for everyone that no one is above the law. I think it's important to the operation of government. I mean, I've I've spent most of my life in government, deeply, deeply in government service. I believe we have a trust. Uh, and, and, and so I, I think that's, that's what we should care about, regardless of sort of who it is. Um, obviously, the more senior uh, role, it's, 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 it, it, it gets more attention. It's important. Uh, but I think everyone who's charged with the public trust, that needs to be safeguarded. That's, and we talked to our, you know, we have 1,500 folks who work in the DA's office. Like, this is a privilege. This is a privilege yeah. to serve. Uh, and, I mean, I call these cases broadly construed, like, power asymmetry cases. They're, they're folks who sort of get power uh, and abuse power, uh, and it's something that we need to police. And I would just underscore, because I think there's a, in all of these cases, a sense of sort of, to sort of seize on to whoever it may be, whether it's, uh, you know, a mayor or a former president, to sort of, Get back a lot. This is something we do every single day in the DA's office. And for me, you know, this goes back to my first day as a prosecutor in the public integrity. And so I prosecuted, you know, uh, an FBI agent, uh, a mayor and a deputy mayor, a council member, the former majority leader of the state Senate, um, a sitting district attorney. I mean, this is, this is what we do. We hold folks accountable when, when they break the law. Which, which is an absolutely appropriate thing to do. And obviously, there are twin priorities here. Equal justice under law and proven guilty. You just rattled off a bunch of cases. You know, just less people think it's about this administration. I think even with the Supreme Court raising the standards for prosecution of corruption around the former Virginia governor, um, <clears throat> uh, I think there's a sense that there seems to be a lot in, in our city and state. And, and, and let's just... You know, first of all, are, are there any others you're, you're aware of? Any other investigations, folks? I'm going to pause on because I think it's a very important point and doesn't fully apply to local prosecutors. So when I first started as a as a lawyer before as a prosecutor, the Skilling decision came out, the Enron decision. Um, for those who practice in this space or more broadly have followed it, the Supreme Court for the past 20 plus years, and you just alluded to, mm-hmm. you know, the, the last iteration, which was last term, has narrowed, I think, 
improperly as a former federal prosecutor, but narrowed the scope of federal, the, the main federal public corruption statute and has invited, uh, for example, in the Bridgegate uh, case involving the George Washington Bridge. I mean, that decision says this is a local matter. Uh, and the Supreme Court has, in my view, sort of said, this is for me. Mm -hmm. uh, this is for, so when I've talked to our office and I say I've done this work and it's sort of really brought it into the office of focus, uh, it is against the backdrop of the legal landscape. The tools at the federal level are not what they were. Um, uh, and we are trying to police that space. Uh, and I think it's important to do so. So but in terms of support for you, I mean, what steps should New York City or state be taking to combat corruption more systemically? That's a, that, I mean, I, that's an exceptional question, I, and, and I take that to be sort of a, a beyond enforcement, sort of a yes. policy sense. Yes. Look, I, I think that the, the, our campaign finance uh, case that we brought, um, you know, I, I think that the, our statute is great. I think some in this room probably advocated for it, maybe everyone in this room. Um, I think more resources in the enforcement side um, would be very helpful. Um, I think that um, across the board, Campaign finance reform is important uh, and helps drive discussions in races. And so that we shouldn't, uh, maybe I'm responding to an argument that hasn't been made here, but I've seen some, oh, well, see all these cases about campaign finance reform. Why don't we just, well, I suppose about straw donors, why don't we just get rid of the scheme? I think that's wrong. I think we need to give uh, the CFB and others the, the resources to police the space and in, if anything, sort of go in the other direction and go to smaller dollars. Uh, and I think it drives, and I speak now sort of as a candidate in a race, um, it's, 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 it's a bit, um, I mean, the, 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 the maximum in, for the DA's race in Manhattan is $35,000. <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. right? I mean, and, and, and so we need reform. Yeah. Uh, in, in, in lots of spaces in terms of sort of the limits. Uh, and I think that in terms of some of the, um, the sort of day in, day out governance, I thought about this more from enforcement. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to give the, I think the more you do these cases, I think you do get deterrence. Um, and so I think policing the space is really important. All right. And that was a, a reasonably good segue to the, the Trump questions, which, you know, have to be asked um, because, you know, the times we live in. Uh, I think there's still a lot of questions, and you've answered this, but I think it's important to, to do so again, on why you didn't pursue the Trump prosecution on the charges that Pomerantz and Dunn recommended that Attorney General James seems to be pursuing, apparently successfully, uh, with regard to, you know, ruling of fraud. What, what, you know, in a civil sense, not a criminal, obviously, that's what she's doing. Just walk people through your decision on why you felt that that shouldn't go forward in your office. So that any lawyer who's practicing uh, and, and looked at the code of professional responsibility will understand why I'm not going to answer that question, right? Um, uh, you know, we're in the middle of active litigation about these very issues that right? the defense has raised. Some, in fact, if you look at the defense motion papers, they liberally cite to Mark Pomerantz's book, mm -hmm. um, which is a reason why you don't write a book in the middle of an active investigation. Um, and certainly as the lead prosecutor, you don't talk about it. So I'm, I'm not going to do it. I think it would be unethical okay. um, uh, and untoward. And even if it wasn't unethical, I think it's, it's um, everyone has a right to, uh, you know, a, a, a fair and open jury pool, including everyone we charge. Mm -hmm. So the due process implications, what I can say, uh, and I guess I will fall back on my record a little bit is, which I think, and I, I will, perhaps this is immodest, those cases I talked about, I, I don't know of any other prosecutor who can talk about that many prominent public corruption cases, mm -hmm. who's had an omnibus career. There may be someone in DC who spent the last 50 years on public corruption. So my, my, I think my track record for bringing hard cases when they're ready um, and actually having, um, and that this is not, I don't suggest this as a predictor because mm -hmm. one shouldn't do that, but also having a lot of success in those cases. Um, and so, you know, my approach over 20 years has <laughs> been to surround myself and we, and we did, we brought in a phenomenal team and I will say also consulted with career prosecutors been doing this. Uh, and so the decision wasn't, so it wasn't a, brag decision obviously i'm the, no, no. the, the final decision maker uh and made a, a decision to you know charge the case we charged and we're going to try that case in march well and, and you're, you're moving forward the, the case you did charge by the way i mean uh i i for what it's worth I, I do think that those the hush money payments can be fairly construed as election interference i mean you know in I, terms of, we, of their outcome that and so i understand why i pursued that now this is scheduled in march 
the opposite. Um, the federal investigation into January 6th. Um, there's some question whether the judge might punt, uh, which could bring it closer to the election or, or even after the election. What, what's your posture on that? We stand at the ready. We're officers of the court. We told the, the judge when he asked for scheduling that initially we were ready in January, we we're ready in February, we we're in March, we we're in April. I, mean, I don't think he's going to do this, but we'd be ready tomorrow. Uh, and so uh, that's our job. So you're our not job. worried if it gets pushed out so well, it doesn't I, 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 I worry about things which I have control over. Fair. Uh, Very stoic of you. Uh, I appreciate and, that. And, and, and our role, all right? Our, yeah. our role, uh, and maybe and I don't mean to intend this to be sort of coy, but I think this is our role, right? Our role is to, to be ready. We built the case. We're ready to try the case. Um, you know, this is in some ways unprecedented. There's many sure. cases, yeah. but it's also, it's not novel. We, you know, certainly have been in matters with, where we have to talk to other jurisdictions have conflicting trial dates. Ultimately, it'll be up to the judge. We've given the judge, you know, our um, assurance that we are sure. available and ready. Uh, and, and also that we're, you know, we've indicated we're not going to sort of sit on ceremony, right? This, the, 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 we will go when we're ready. There's a trial date. We can't have two trials at the same time. Right. Uh, and, and if they go forward, there may be, then there may be a conflict. I think the judge is judiciously waiting to see when we get closer, sort of where we are. Uh, and our task is to, you know, we've got our pretrial motions that have been submitted. Those will be argued in early next year. And so we're, 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 presenting ready, a we're ready to go. Okay. March 25th, you know, unless we're told otherwise, we'll be there. I've got two more questions, actually, a lot more the time. I've got two more questions. Then I want to get to the questions in, in, in the room. Uh, one is on, on hate crimes. You've been pushing for reform to the hate crime legislation, obviously, especially in the wake of the October 7th attack in Israel. Uh, we have seen a real spike in hate crimes, but not only since then. It's been a problem over the last few years. Uh, explain to people what reforms you feel need to be made in Albany to the hate crime statute. Sure. Maybe I'll just take a step back and talk about the hate crime statute a little bit. So the hate crime statute is one of, and I would say in my 20 plus years, can only think of one other statute uh, where you, you have to prove motive as an element of the crime. So not just that, you know, A punches B and B was armed, uh, but A punches B and causes that harm motivated in substantial part by, and it's not animus, um, but it's by, um, you know, gender, race, because we do have sometimes when it's like Ponzi scheme and we have going to pick on all black investors, but it's not out of animus, but substantially motivated by someone's race, someone's religion, someone's sexual orientation. Uh, and that proof of that motive can be quite challenging. I've tried a, a case like this uh, with the, the, that had motive as, a, as, a, as an intent. The, the statute is a, is a sentencing enhancement. So assault is the crime and assault is a hate crime, then it enhances the sentence. And the statute's a bit like Swiss cheese. Mm -hmm. uh, it applies to some crimes, but doesn't apply to others in a way that is um, not particularly cogent. So just give an example. Uh, I guess I'll stick with assault. Um, if, if, if you punch me, I'll make myself a victim. If you, if you, punch, if you, if you punch me um, because I'm black, uh, we can charge you with assault as a hate crime. But now I've made <coughs> the perpetrator. That's probably not That's fair. That's terrible either. too. It's fine. Um, uh, if, that whole table comes over and punches me because I'm black. I can't charge them with the, the statute for group assault. It's called gang assault. I can't charge them with gang assault for hate crime because it's not a predicate in the statute. Which seems great. No, makes no sense. Okay. And so we, we identified 31 um, crimes that are not predicates under the statute that we see recur in our practice. That we have, we literally sit across the table you know, from victims and they say, well, wh what do you mean? You know, he called me this name um, and X happening. So it's just not in the stat. I mean, you can imagine how bad that is. And so um, in a way, I had, had a, a lot of sort of almost personal pride because we, we pulled together a very broad coalition um, of, of folks who are sort of working on hate crime from almost every perspective uh, to stand together and call for Albany to say, look, you got it. You got to add these 31 crimes in. Um, and so, you know, to help us do our, our job. I would take a step back and, and, and sort of underscore what you said. Sadly, this is not new. So two months in my first testimony in front of the city council, I asked for $1.7 million to expand our hate crime unit. We had three ADAs who were trained uh, in the statute. 
I had members of the AAPI community, uh, which at that point was the lead on our docket in terms of numbers saying, you literally don't speak Cantonese or Mandarin, like you don't speak our language. How can we trust you? How can we mm-hmm. tell us? So we expanded our capacity, um, you know, trained. We now have 25 or so ADAs trained in the statute. Um, we hired investigators with um, uh, additional language capabilities. We brought in some outreach <laughs> folks. It's a very underreported crime. So even though that we see the uptick, that's still that number is, 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 is low. It's much, much like, I would say, sexual assault. It's an area where you really have to continue to work. It doesn't reflect what's, what's going on. So we... We were we were we we sort of prepared and built the unit um, uh, to be ready. Mm-hmm. We obviously, didn't know this one would, would be here. Um, and as you, you know, I mean, they they are tremendously great. I mean, I talk. They are um, tragically busy at this moment. Um, I've got uh, questions that have been submitted in advance. I want to get to the room, but one final question: uh, Before your predecessor, Cy Vance, we had two DAs uh, who served for over thirty years. Hogan and Morgan, extraordinary towering figures, but I mean, it's like almost 70 years between them if you add it all up. Do you think there should be term limits for district attorneys? Well, I can tell you this. I'm not going to be in the seat for 30 years. So there may be a, there'll be, there'll be a non-statutory term limit, uh, uh, which I will not specify today. Um, uh, I, I, think, I think that, and I'll go back to sort of the tension I mean, I think there is tension um, when you look at the federal model with appointed U.S. attorneys there between representative democracy and accountability, which I think is great. Mm-hmm. Like we're doing more outreach out in communities um, and learning from people uh, and talking to them about what we're doing more than I think the office has ever done. And I think that's important. Um, but this, the, sort of the, this is a this is a role that's got to be independent. Um, and so I do think. That longevity, I mean, Mr. Morgenthau, I get all these, one of the perks of this job, I get all these great stories about Mr. Morgenthau. Uh, and I think that- The longevity helped the- The longevity helped. So I, I do think as a general matter, term, term limits are very good. I don't know, I haven't given thought because I know I'm not gonna do 30 years as to what the right you know, number uh, is. But I do think when we think about this role, um, and now I will talk more broadly just about, you know, and it's, it's across the political spectrum. I, I think we're not holding this role um, sort of as sacrosanct as it should be. And we really, really, I mean, fundamental to the rule of law and, 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 and our representative democracy is the independence of prosecutors. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yes, it's fair for people to ask me you know, why you didn't bring this case then and why did, and you know, we'll, we'll answer responsibly all the questions because I'm not saying we should be set aside and, and not responsive, um, but, but we, we, we can't be, it is not, uh, you know, the sort of, we shouldn't be the city council member. We should, we should be out there, but we should not no. be. Um, what I tell my folks is to be mindful of the world, you know, and live in it, you know, but at the end of the day, they, you know, you follow the facts, uh, as Mr. Morgan, I would say, you know, without fear or favor, that's the job. Uh, and I think, so I think some ways of insulation are really, really important. To follow the facts without fear or favor, always a good principle. All right, let's take some questions from folks in the audience. Uh, beginning with, uh, so board members, yes, sir. Wait, wait. Tony Smith there. He's got a microphone. Wait, 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 wait. So folks can hear you at home. I was interested that uh, Rikers came up just once. Uh, and I can't imagine a more complicated situation. I don't even know under whose jurisdiction Rikers Island itself comes. It could be three or four district attorneys, but the issue, it seems to me, we know a lot. We know that the third year after release is a dangerous recidivist point. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, anything happens in terms of notifications, uh, but uh, I just wonder, do you have any relationship uh, horizontally with the Department of Correction I can't imagine an agency that needs more outside attention and positive support, uh, but I don't know if you have a role in that. So I can answer the first piece very easily. <coughs> Bronx County, so the Bronx District Attorney's Office has jurisdiction over enforcement of things like sort of an assault happens at Rikers. It's within um, the Bronx District Attorney's huh. jurisdiction. It's weird. Uh, uh, and uh, the second piece, our relationship. So, yes, I mean, I'm, I'm talking to, um, you know, we have a deputy mayor for public safety, Phil Banks. 
um, obviously that there's, there's some questions about the specific leadership of, of DOC at the moment, but yeah, I've been in touch with um, um, Commissioner Molina. I was at Rikers two weeks ago, because uh, I think it's important for prosecutors to know where we are sending people. Um, we've incorporated that into our, our training. Uh, we, for our, for our sort of new lawyers, um, we had the, 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 the oversight, the BOC, um, come into a training. So this, these are, uh, and two, I would say, because I think they have a really, really unique perspective on what happens on the island. Um, on the panel was the head of the BOC and then two former doctors. Um, uh, and it was really, I think, important for our ADAs. So we have an ongoing dialogue. I've got deep concern about, um, you know, sending people to Rikers Island and my, you know, prior life at the AG's office, I, I sued uh, Nassau County's provider of medical care in their county facility. Um, and so this is something I spent a lot of time thinking about. Um, I, I will maybe broaden the question a little bit. The, the number one issue I think we face in the criminal justice system is, is mental health. Um, the, the number of people in Rikers suffer from mental health is tremendously high. And this spans the guy from we have trained push cases that we're prosecuting. Um, there's certainly sort of mental health issues there. We have you know, obviously the overwhelming number of people with mental health aren't committing violent crimes. But the, the, and I call it sort of the third lane, it's sort of our need. We, we every day are making decisions about where to send people and do not have a good third lane. And so there are people who are suffering from mental health who we cannot responsibly release back into neighborhoods. We, it's just not, it's not something we can do consistent with public safety. But we also know that sending them to, to Rikers is certainly not helping their mental health. Um, and we know the recidivism rate. Um, uh, and so, I mean, I was really happy to be about a month ago, um, I mean, some of you may know the Greenberger Center, uh, they broke ground on, on, um, on Hope House, which is Francis Greenberger's son was charged with a crime before I was DA in Manhattan. Um, they said he can be out pre-trial if you can find a secure mental health facility uh, and none such facility existed. He's now built it, um, but he's built it with 16 beds. I think they can open six months later. We need about 100 Hope Houses. Uh, and I think one um, that will relieve from the pressure on Rikers Island um, uh, and there are safety issues there. We have doors that don't lock. You know, the whole point is that I mean, we have doors that don't lock it, right? We have arson going. I mean, it's, it's a tremendous, tremendous problem. But if we had this third lane where we could, where we house people, one, they would get better. Recidivism would go down. We would all be safer. And the system would be a lot more humane. So if I, you know, I could discovery, if discovery was one ask, that's sort of a second ask. It's a that, collective that's, voice. That's really that's driver of homelessness as well. And, and, and where do you, just briefly, where do you stand on the mayor's proposal to be able to involuntarily, uh, you know, um, What's the right word? Uh, house the mentally, the, the violent mentally. So we have our own program, okay. uh, uh, our, our navigator program, which um, is in conjunction. So we, I mentioned the Fortune Society where we have folks and we funded $3 million for that. We funded the bridge, which is, an, I'm just using this guy, know that folks in the room know these, know these organizations to do community navigation, to be out in uh, communities that we've selected based on data, to intervene before crime exists. and we really think that the two of those in tandem, the court and community okay. navigation, we think are gonna be tremendously impactful. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Hi, good morning. Uh, I had a question about discovery. I am not a trained lawyer, so I'm just getting up to speed as a resident of Brooklyn, but you mentioned how Manhattan, New York County is better resourced than the other four boroughs, but at the same time, discovery is happening, a discovery reform is happening um, across the five counties. So how does, how do you see along with your other four DAs sort of equality of the resources that are forthcoming or not forthcoming yet in discovery reform? So for anyone from the city council that may be watching, let me just add a footnote. We are resource commensurate with the needs of Manhattan, uh, and we need more resources. Uh, I think particularly, I, I, I may have limited that my prior remarks. I think particularly when you compare downstate to upstate, we have, we have, we have more resources here. Um, I think our, our white collar resources um, are, are probably <laughs> second to none in the country. Um, but that's, just, that's, that's, a, that's when I go back in February, because we do need more resources. I don't want to give the false impression. We're working together on this. Uh, you know, we work together. Um, on our pitch to Albany, 
we've been working together on, on technology. Um, you know, we're in about 2010 uh, in terms of our IT infrastructure. Uh, you know, one thing that, um, and it's a work in progress uh, to get some economies of scale is if we were all on the same platform, that would help the NYPD process data. Um, and then I think the real home run, and we're not there yet, is that the NYPD was on the same. I mean, there's some things that the NYPD, so for example, it, it, and this is something that's different from 15 years ago, right? Almost any arrest uh, involves four or five uh, you know, body-worn cameras from the NYPD, um, which obviously we need to review and produce. And then, you know, uh, you know in a, in a, some of them can be 25 body-worn cameras. You know, the NYPD has capacity in-house to sort of process and turn that around far more quickly than the, than the DA's offices. And we're sort of working with City Hall and NYPD to sort of get us access. So one of the, 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 the things that really saves us uh, is we have some folks kind of seconded, if you will, uh, or designated from the NYP who will help us with you know, logins and processing. But there's a technological way to do that more seamlessly. We're working on that. I think that is the three to five year solution. It just doesn't, doesn't, doesn't help tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Eleanor? Um, I wondered if we could go back to Rikers for just a minute uh, and talk about, I, I wasn't clear uh, what you thought about the possibility of a federal monitor and also whether or not the plan to close Rikers is still on board, whether you see any possibility uh, for that. I mean, we've been looking at the numbers of people who died on, at, I mean, I think it's 14 this year and 16 last year. So, um, so just talk about the future of Rikers and whether or not a federal monitor really is the right thing to happen. So I, I think, so, so we have, a, we have a, a monitor now for a receiver, right? So I think the receiver to be kind of, right? No, I just wanna, I just wanna, so I'm, the, the, the receivership, I think is necessary, but not sufficient, not to sound overly loyally. Like, so I think, you know, we're just, we need something. We need, the status quo does not, is not working. Uh, I have tremendous respect. So Damian Williams, the current U.S. attorney and I were colleagues together in the office. You know, he's obviously, you know, he's close. He's in the litigation. He's supported it. That's very meaningful to me. Um, and so I think the monitors work tremendously hard over now a number of years. Uh, and it's not, we, we, you know, I, you know, we see the, we need, we need something different. So I don't think the receiver is a panacea, right? I don't think this is going to be something. In fact, when you talk to folks, as I've had a little bit, I'm not an expert in this area, but the, what's the sort of precedent, and there's not a ton of it in other places, is there's, there's some long-term advances, but the receiver, it's not a day one or week one or month one. Um, so I think we're in a very acute place and we need that, but that we should not be thinking that even four months later, we've sort of solved it. It's going to, I think this is a, it, this is, this is a long issue. And I know that's not, that's not um, satisfying. That's not, that doesn't make me you know, feel good, uh, but I do think it's a reality. So I think that's the next phase. I think the briefing schedule goes out to about March. Um, and, and I obviously don't presume to know what judge Swain will do. Um, but in my view, um, as a, as a non-litigant in that matter, but as someone who sends people to Rikers, I think we got to do something different. Um, and the receiver is the thing on the table, but we also have to think about what else we can do. And so I would go back to this last, I mean, I, I don't think we should just do one thing. I think let's look at the receiver for the conditions there. Let's build more hope houses. Uh, let's do what we're doing, um, you know, on the front end with fortune. So we have. <clears throat> less recidivism, so we don't have as many people going to Rikers um, in the first place. Uh, and we've had a couple other niches that I'm happy to talk about that are, um, you know, we, we look at um, in, in Manhattan, I think this is true in other boroughs, the biggest driver historically, but certainly now, um, because our senses of who's going is, is, is down, um, is length of stay. Um, and so I think there are other operational things we've been talking to the courts. So trying more cases. There are some there are folks in Rikers who or just been there for more than a year waiting for a trial. Um, and they either need to be convicted and go upstate or be released. 
Um, and that's not, that kind of thing doesn't hit the front page, but that's just an operational. And that's so many parts. That's, um, you know, DOC getting the person to the trial on time. It's having enough judges. We need more judges in New York County. Um, and so I would, you know, I feel like I, I didn't come with like a wish list to ask for things, but this is something else we can no, use no, to help no. us as you know, right? Like we need more judges. We need, we need sort of an all of the above approach on, on we, rights. We, yeah, we care about solutions. So yeah, we got run time for two more questions. I run, one, one I'd gotten emailed from Alan Rothstein, longtime member of the board, um, who asked you about the asset forfeiture fund. So this is something that basically, you know, I guess your predecessor, I mean, hundreds of millions of dollars can be souped up into this. Uh, what what are you doing with it? Should that process be reformed? Sometimes it's characterized as a slush fund. That seems pejorative, but it's a lot of money. Uh, and 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 what what should be done about it? it was a lot of money. Okay, <laughs> there you By go. By the time I got there, I mean it's relatively. I'm not saying it's nothing. Look, the 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 the, the programs I mentioned. So the the program with the Fortune Society, that's forfeiture funding. The program with the Bridge, the community navigators, the court navigators. Um, and so we are prioritizing. Um, prevention, um, particularly sort of you know, the mental health prevention uh, with that, with those funding, we're also using some of that funding for reentry. Uh, and we also funded the last two years, we haven't talked much about gun violence, which I do think is the, the sort of number one issue facing um, Manhattan in terms of public safety. So we've given grants the last two years to groups that work directly with youth affected by gun violence. So that's how we're using the money. The, the law changed, the, the, the prior governor changed the law so that we no longer get uh, the forfeiture. So that the law is straight. You're putting it back into this community. All right, yes, sir. Elon. Uh, thank you for being here, Elon Mazel of the Emory Shelley Firm. And I've spent uh, about 25 years, among other things, bringing civil rights cases against police officers for violating the constitution. And my question for you is, do you feel that a district attorney's office is the appropriate vehicle to bring criminal cases against police officers to break the law? Or given the relationships between DAs and the NYPD, are we better off with an independent prosecutor to prosecute those cases? I know your firm well. Uh, we could have this conversation for an hour. I'll try to give the, the, the two minute uh, version. So when I was at the attorney general's office, I was the inaugural um, chief of a unit that was charged with investigating and prosecuting um, civilian deaths of unarmed persons caused by police officers. We advocated for that, um, that the role uh, in those cases should go to the attorney general. So it was important that it be an elected, someone is accountable to the people, going back to the representative democracy point, but that it not be uh, the prosecutor who has the day in, day out relationship with the, with the you know, one law enforcement agency. Um, either for actual bias or more likely the perception. I think that's important. People ask me, well, now you're DA, do you want to change that and do that? No, I, I believe firmly in that principle. The attorney general is, is doing those cases. Um, I think that the cases that don't involve death um, are fundamentally different. I mean, one of those are the most important cases in the system. Uh, and I think it makes sense to move those uh, to another uh, prosecutor. Um, the logistical issues. I mean, not to, I mean, in a case that doesn't involve death, there's someone who's alive. Oftentimes there is more than one investigation going on, right? So there could be an investigation of a, someone gets, um, you know, um, arrested and, and harmed um, in the context of that arrest after they have robbed the store. Well, the robbery of the store will still be prosecuted. The, the, even if it's valid that uh, there's a claim for the excessive force, it doesn't vitiate or undo the, um, the, the initial criminal conduct. Uh, those logistical issues, I think, are really hard to navigate between two offices. Um, you know, and I will say, I think we developed a really great model. I, mean, I spent, you know, I would say side by side with the, the, the public corruption. I view these cases, public, public corruption, power asymmetry cases. I mentioned I prosecuted an FBI agent. I prosecuted a sitting district attorney while I was a prosecutor at the AG's office in that very unit. You know, I represented, you know, Eric Garner's mother in a case against the city. So this is stuff that I feel very, very strongly about. Um, and I think I have expertise in. So I have the unit report directly to me. Uh, and so it's cabined off uh, from um, the other office, both in terms of actual influence. Um, you know, they're not doing a case with an officer one day and then potentially investigating that officer the, the next day. Um, and then they're also cabined off, I think, atmospherically, right? Like they are doing their own thing back to sort of, kind of almost independence within independence. Uh, and I think so far, 
um, you know, we're in touch with, uh, I don't know if we've been in touch with anyone. If, if you're from Risa, but we're in touch with a lot of advocates in this space um, and have gotten some, you know, I think people think the model is working. You know, we, we charged uh, the, 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 the former head of Mayor de Blasio's security detail for tampering. Um, you know, we've, we've charged, uh, we've been very active in this space. We've charged, I think, more sort of than the office historically has. We, so I, I was going to run down them, but that's probably 